we tend to think that resilience is in people and that, you know, most people are resilient, but as I said, they don't know how they do it. And we tend to think there are these kind of magic pieces, magic traits that people have, and they're, they're, they don't have to do anything when something happens, but it's, it's not, that's not true at all. What it is, is that people have to, every time something happens, we have to kind of embrace it and deal with it. Welcome to the Spartan Up Podcast with Joe DeSena, founder and CEO of Spartan Race. We are talking about overcoming obstacles. The same way we teach people to get over obstacles on the course, we will teach you here on the Spartan Up Podcast to get over obstacles in your mind. At Spartan, we're on the front lines of resilience, but today we're taking it to a new level. We're talking to George Bonanno professor of clinical psychology at Columbia. He heads the Lost Trauma and Emotion Lab, which has been studying resilience in the face of extreme adversity for over 25 years. He's the author of the new book, The End of Trauma, how the new science of resilience is changing how we think about PTSD. And Joe asks the eternal question, what makes resilience? This episode of Spartan Up is brought to you by Duralane, a single injection that may provide up to six months relief from osteoarthritis knee pain. Risks can include general knee pain and pain at the injection site. You can see full prescribing information at Duralane.com. Joe DeSena here, CEO and founder of Spartan. We are um, in the middle of a Spartan Up podcast with one of my heroes, George Bonanno, professor of clinical psychology at Columbia University. I've been tracking you from the sidelines, um, somewhat okay. stalking, stalking you for, for a long time. And I didn't tell you, you don't know this, but um, my first business uh, 37 years ago um, was a pool cleaning business. And my first customer was the head of the Banano Organized Crime Family. <laughs> So, <laughs> so I don't know if you got any yeah. relation, but just know that their pool is clean. <laughs> I'm glad to hear that. No relations, but that 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 kind of that association stalks me wherever I go. The the crime family. <laughs> so, we're talking about resilience, and um, I grew up in that neighborhood where there were you know four out of the five crime bosses um, lived there, and whether you like it or not, as a kid, as a young boy, um, those were the people that had money. They had nice cars, and. Um, part of their education to becoming a boss and having money was they went to jail. So the, the, the gears were turning in my head at a young age, like, am I tough enough? Am I resilient enough? And, and you've, been, um, you've been studying resilience now. You've had 300,000 plus people come through um, Columbia, or you've studied 300,000 people, I heard? We, have, we get access to, to data sets and we collect data sets. Right now we're collecting a data set through the military with about 100,000 people in it or more. Um, what, what, what's the big, big takeaway in your mind? What's the big takeaway from all that you know, research and all that data? The big takeaway probably would be that most people are resilient. Most people, at least, you know, are basically resilient. They don't know they're resilient. They don't know how or why they're resilient. And that's what I've been studying for, for a number of years now. So I'm not a, um, a psychologist. I'm barely educated. And um, I said to our, our podcast, um, Maven, who's behind the scenes making this happen, before I got on with you, and I said, you know, one of the things I'd like to talk to George about is the fact that every human being is resilient. I mean, we've lasted on the planet for a million years. How would we have lasted? And and so my question for you, first of all, I'm glad that I'm that I guessed a little bit of that. Um, but my question for you, what happens that we kind of, you know, we get dulled edges and we lose some of that resilience? Why? Well, th- this is an interesting point. Resilience is actually we tend to think that resilience is in people and that, you know, most people are resilient, but as I said, they don't know how they do it. We tend to think there are these kind of magic pieces, magic traits that people have, and they're, they're, they don't have to do anything when something happens, but it's, it's not, that's not true at all. What it is, is that people have to, every time something happens, we have to kind of embrace it and deal with it and, we have to use certain kind of way of thinking, a certain kind of mindset, a certain kind of tools that to get to that other side. And that's, the, I think, turning out to be the key. 
that that um, that that allows people to be resilient. And what I've been doing, trying to do lately, and in a new book I have out, I've, I've expelled this out in some detail, is sort of explicitly saying these seem to be the way we do it, and this is something we can use more consciously and directly to get ourselves through these events. What What are the tools? Well, um, there. It's basically what uh, under the umbrella of flexibility. Um, there are lots of little things that we can identify that, that, that are associated with resilience, but they don't actually explain much. And the flexibility part, it has two parts. One of the parts I think is very um, relevant to what you do. As far as I understand what you do and your, the training and the, the kind of focus you have, which is a, a mindset, a certain way of thinking. I call it the flexibility mindset. It involves thinking optimistically that it's going to be okay, thinking, be having confidence in what you can do, confidence in how you can cope with things, and um, it, focusing on the challenge at hand, you know, not, not focusing on the threat so much. When something bad happens to us, we tend to, we, it's easy to think, oh, this is really bad. Looking at the long picture, this is going to change my life, it's going to ruin my life, I'm really screwed here. And instead, we focus on the challenge at hand, and that make, when we do that, we then we can master that piece of the puzzle, move on to the next piece and the next piece, and there's a sense of mastery. I can do this. I will do this. And we get through. And that seems to be how people get through just the worst situations, really the most adverse. What, everything in my research is about the worst things that happen to people. I, I liken it to, but I may be way off here, climbing a mountain. I've done a lot of uh, physical events myself, and it really tests you. You know, you, you get to a place where you, your own mind is telling you to quit, and and then all of a sudden it starts raining, and then all of a sudden you run out of food, and um, but you put one foot in front of the other, and if and if you do it enough times, I guess you get at least for me, you realize that yeah, you know the. Sh- is really hitting the fan. Everything is going wrong. But if I just put one foot in front of the other, eventually it's going to be okay. You know, that's exactly right. There, there's a great story I read recently. Um, you know, years ago, this plane crashed in the Andes of, uh, I think, a Uruguayan uh, uh, rugby team. And the two guys decided they were never going to get out of there unless they climbed out of that region they, were, they, were, they had crashed in. And it was an impossible climb. It was a climb that climbers don't even climb. And these guys did it with, like, insulation from the plane walls wrapped around their feet. It's freezing cold. And every time they got to a plateau, they thought, we are over this peak, only to find that it's just massive peaks ahead. And instead of thinking, oh, my God, we're completely, this is it. We can't do this. They just, they, they kind of took stock, got some rest, and went the next day. And each time it was a little bit more mastery. Well, we're doing it. We can do this. And then they got, they eventually climbed this impossible peak together. And I think that's, that's pretty much how it works. It's a great metaphor, actually. Do, do you think, I, I know uh, we don't always do it, um, but I think what you're saying is as we're climbing that mountain, that metaphorical mountain, we should take a look back and see where we came from. Because I do that once in a while, actually. And I say, wow, wow, look how... Look how daunting up above looks, but look how far we've come. Yeah, I think it's all part of, of thinking, you know, I, I can do this. I'm going to be okay. I can do this. Um, and seeing where you've come from is a great motivator because it tells you, yeah, I've already done some of this and it's, I'm still okay. You know, I'm basically here. You know, I did some research with spinal cord injury patients. All the people in this study were, had, were permanently paralyzed. And they were remarkably okay. You know, they were, they were, there was a, we compared them with the normal population. The resilient group, not everybody was okay, but the resilient group was okay. There was a majority showed this resilient pattern. We follow people over time. And those people were actually not any more depressed than the normal population, than the, the population in the community. And so I got interested in how they did it. And they did it with some of these very same pieces. They, they had this fighting spirit. We asked them about questions about that, and they, had, they, they endorsed this fighting spirit, and they were confident, well, I'll do this. And I think along the way, they began to realize, I have a spinal cord injury. I'm paralyzed for the rest of my life, but I'm still me, and I'm okay, and I've been okay for a while now in the hospital and whatever, and, 
and I'm going to be okay. You know, this is, I'll, I'll live with this. I can do this and I can make myself better. And they have, they have a lot of work ahead of them. So they, they've motivated them to do that work, to strengthen their body. So you can learn confidence? Confidence is, it's one of those things. You, you can learn to be optimistic by thinking about op, the future, certainly. But confidence in how you cope really comes, in a way, the proof is in the pudding. You have to show yourself you can do it. But a, a lot of people do that, right? And, and they're able to do it. And I think we tend to think, we've seen this when we try to do this in places where, you know, in the field where people are really struggling with, with really horrible stuff that happens. And it's a little harder than to, to kind of, think of yourself that way. It's much better to kind of get develop this these kind of these mindset before something happens when you have a chance. But when even when you're um, when people are really in the middle of something, if they don't at least have some basic confidence, it's harder to think, well, I'll be okay even when they're not sure. It's harder to think clearly. But if we develop these skills, you know, in the in the context of say normal everyday difficulties, which there are many of those, then we get we get a chance to develop the skills. Most of the time, people don't necessarily think that they're 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 good coping or they're good at you know getting by stressful events until they take a look, and they have to. That's one of the things that I like to suggest people do is to take a look at how you're doing with things. You know, you've actually dealt with this okay. You've dealt with this okay. You're here now. You can deal with this next thing okay. So, Joe, this is this is all the one part of the puzzle. This mindset. Um, and then the other part, we've we spent a lot of time trying to break this down. I call it the flexibility sequence. It's how we actually get, say, that small piece to the next plateau on the mountain. So that the mindset gets us motivated. And then the actual sequence is really we, we simply um, we take, a, take assessment of what we have to do. We think about what this requires of us. And then we think about what we're able to do. And then we try things and, and, and regroup if it doesn't work. I think there's a kind of a myth about resilience that, you know, you have the, the, you have the right tool, you use it, you're to the next spot. But like any problem, I live in an old building in New York. The plumbers come or the wall people, the wall guys come to repair something and they just scratch their heads because look at this problem. This thing's crumbling now that I took it apart. And they have to come up with a new solution, right? They have to discuss among themselves and come up with a new solution. They always do it. They always get it done, right? So I think life is a little bit like that. So, and and it, part of the idea and then the way we think about this is, you know, nobody gets it right every time. Just hang in there and correct it, you know. Try the next thing that, that might work for you. You just brought back a memory. As you, as you talk about this mindset, you brought back a memory of, believe it or not, the banana crime family where I would clean the pool and I'd have to work on the pool heater and the pool heater didn't work. And there was a party that weekend and my life depended on fixing this thing. Um, and yeah. what would happen is, you know, was it the pressure switch? It has to be the pressure switch. That would be easy because I have one in my truck and everybody's going to be happy. Nope. It's not the press. Oh, is it the burner? No. And invariably, you know, you'd spend three hours in this little room the heater could explode on you, but after going through seven or eight iterations of potential, you find it. And maybe, maybe I eventually, my brain learned that if you just stick to it yeah. and you keep trying things, it eventually works. And it is, it's so true. And the more that we realize that this is part of getting to the next hump, the easier that gets. I think when we first try something, it doesn't work. We say, I can't do this. The typical response we hear from a lot of people is, I can't do this. I'm screwed. And the more we understand that, you know, nothing always works, you try something else and you try something else. And this is what our research shows really clearly. All these things that we know are associated with being resilient, but they just don't always work because every situation is different. And statistically, they don't always work. And I think we... Knowing that really helps because then they say, okay, well, this is what I often do, but it's not going to work now. I got to try something else. And that's, I think, enormously empowering to know that, you know, to know that I just have to keep trying things until I get it. This is interesting because you used the word flexibility before. And, yeah. and maybe for me, um, not being a professor, the word resilience almost reminds me of a rock in the river that just stands there and keeps taking the pounding. But yeah. Bruce, Lee, Bruce Lee said, you got to be the water. So 
So it's a little bit of being willing to take the pounding, I guess, but then being flexible enough to change. That works. And, and I think that the, the part I would add to that is you have to know that you're, you're going to be flexible here. You have to know that, you know, this might not work and I'm going to go around it. I'm going to find a way to, find a way to go around it. You know, that's really – knowing that really makes a difference because then we, we don't get preoccupied with how hard something is or what a failure we, we are, you know, all those things, you know. Yeah, what should I do? You know, we've got uh, – in a non-COVID year, we've got a million and a half people um, that come out and do our races, our crazy races. Mm-hmm. And, you know, a lot of people quit. They're out there and they're just – it's just too hard and – or they don't even start. We'll be right back to this interview, but first a message from today's sponsor, Doralane. You know that knee pain can really slow you down. Sometimes that knee pain is due to osteoarthritis, a disease that affects some 14 million Americans. Learn about osteoarthritis knee pain and how to alleviate it at oaneepainrelief.com. You'll find information there about non-surgical, non-opioid treatments for osteoarthritis knee pain that may help delay the need for knee surgery. One treatment you'll find there is Doralane a single injection that may provide up to six months of relief from osteoarthritis knee pain. It's indicated for the treatment of mild to moderate osteoarthritis knee pain when conservative treatments have not worked. Risks can include general knee pain and pain at the injection site. Full prescribing information is at Doralane.com. Spartans say no to limits. You can learn more at oaneepainrelief.com. That's oaneepainrelief.com. All right, back to the interview. Yeah, what should I do? You know, we've got uh, in a non-COVID year, we've got a million and a half people um, that come out and do our races, our crazy races. Mm -hmm. And, you know, a lot of people quit. They're out there and they're just it's just too hard and or they don't even start. Are these the races where they're, they're, they're cold and you have to go through all kinds of different things? Oh, I know about these races. Yeah. You better know about these races. This is I'm the, I'm, the, I'm the Spartan founder. Come on, and and you're the resilience professor. You can't find a more resilience test than a Spartan race. But but we, we put on these events. We get about a million and a half people a year, and many people quit or they or they're just afraid to start. And I would argue, but you feel free to on my podcast. Feel free to tell me that I'm wrong. Um, I feel like. If you if you fight through using all the tools you just described and you come to the finish line, it kind of builds on itself. And then all of a sudden you could do something a little harder and a little like like a lot of people scratch their head and say, Joe, why would I do one of these ridiculous races? I could just watch Netflix and I could hang out on my couch. And why would I ever do that? And, and I argue because it's going to help you build a tool set that you could apply to other parts of life. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think that's very much true because it gives you confidence. It also shows you you can do more than you thought you can do. I think that's probably the key part of it. Um, now, I don't I do cold exposure myself. That's I don't I haven't done one of your races. And, you know, maybe someday I'll do that, too. But I go out in in, in the in, around my apartment. I live in New York City and I go out running in the park. I do stairs. And I get down to zero sometimes, you know, with just shorts and a shirt. You know, I could probably go naked in New York and nobody would even notice it. But, you know, I, I do the shorts. And um, when I first began to do that, I thought, how could I ever do this? And then I heard that people do these things. I think I read about your races in a book by uh, Carey. I'm blank, blank on his first name. Uh, was it yes. Dana Carey or Benjamin Carey? I forget. Not Carey. Um, I, I, I know the right book, Scott Carney, Scott Carney. Yeah, yes. I think that's what I read about. Yeah. And um, and that when I began to try that, I thought, oh, wow, I, this is not what I thought it was and I can do it. And I've gotten down to, as I said, you know, zero and, you know, and done things. And it's it's every time still to this day, every time it makes me feel so alive. Like I can do things that I didn't know I could do. And I think that's the value. Absolutely. The value of races like like the races you run and the, the, the focus that you have is that it um, it teaches people over and over that they can do more than they thought they could and they can do it in ways they didn't think they could. They can find different resources probably every time. There, there are different pieces to that race. I want to invite you. Um, you, you just gave me an idea. 
um, November 20th weekend. I don't know if it's 20 or 21st at City Field because you're in New York. If you're around, and this is really funny, I've become friends oddly with the CEO of Saks Fifth Avenue, which is the antithesis of everything we're talking about. And my friend, the CEO, carries around two poodles. And um, he, he, he's not, although he's a resilient guy, running a business that big re- requires resilience for sure. He, he's just, he wants to bring his team out uh, to toughen them up at that event. I would love to have you out there, even just to give a talk about everything we're talking about to that, to that group. And then if you're feeling frisky, um, you could wear shorts and a t-shirt and um, you, you could do, you could do our event, but it would be my honor uh, to have you there teaching. Uh, you know, we get about eight or 9,000 people to these events. You could, by the way, I'm not pitching the event. On, I'm, I'm, no, I'm just no, thinking, no, yeah. Yeah, I'm just thinking that's an idea to, I would, um, I would love to do that. I would love to do that. If I can fit it in my schedule, I'd be happy to do that. Yeah. That could be amazing. Um, so we'll, we'll work on that. I'll tell you a fun story. Um, and I still can't get over the sanitation story. Um, yeah. it just, by the way, it just goes to show you, but by the way, uh, you see uh, the movie unbroken or, um, I had a guy on the podcast, Dan Crowley, who went through, uh, parts of the Bataan death march. And when I think oh, yeah. about, I, I, I say to myself, we're all the same. We're wired the same, same biology. It's just, it really is, uh, how you frame it in your mind. Like clearly we have the tools to get through stuff. And so you just, but our parents, I don't want to take anything away from your book, but I'm about to launch a book on parenting and creating resilience. I probably should have collaborated with you and, and, and looked at your studies it would have made my book better. Um, but, but, um, is there a way to parent that's going to more six, you know, make that child more resilient? Well, um, I don't know if I'm an expert on parenting. I've raised two kids um, in New York City, but I think probably what I can see of the parents I know now and the way things have gone with parenting is that it's very important to let children fail, to let them do things on their own more than I think is, 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 is common now and to let them fail. Because in failure, you learn, especially if it's done in a context of a safe home and, you know, love from parents, failure is how you learn. And children learn very well, you know, and there have been lots of studies of children and resilience and children are faced with, you know, the worst things that we know about chronic poverty or long time abuse or, you know, really dire circumstances. A lot of those kids end up doing just fine in life and being resilient. So they find a way. There's elasticity there. And I think the support and love of someone uh, is really important. One of the things that I think stands out is, is having a confidant. And one of, your, one of the parents at least can be that confidant. Whatever the child says is okay, and I'm going to listen to it. And you know, I think that combination, letting children fail, also there are things to teach children, obviously, about you know, de- decoding different situations and learning different skills, but... Um, I think other than that, you know, sometimes skidding out of their way and letting them grow up with a support to be, you know, find a place to be supported, but also letting them take chances and move away and, and, and fail. I think that's the biggest thing that comes to mind. I like that. I like that a lot. And I, I reflect on my own parenting as I listen, because our instinct as parents is to um, have that safety net and protect, Yeah, yeah. you know. I feel like I'm failing every day with, with this business, especially through COVID. And there are days I want to quit just like anybody. Don't tell any, don't tell anybody that, by the way, I'm supposed, <laughs> I'm supposed to be really tough. I am. Um, the thing that keeps me going is, is our mission. I want to change a hundred million lives. It was a big audacious goal. I just stuck it on a whiteboard and um, it's ridiculous in some ways, but I want to change a hundred million lives. And when I want to quit, I think about the goal and I think about the emails that come in and, and people saying I stopped drinking, I, whatever they may be. Is, is mission or purpose a big part of being resilient? Yes, I think so. Um, it, there has to be a sense. I think it goes along with the, the mindset that we talked about 
what I would say the flexibility mindset of you know optimism, focusing on the challenge, confidence in your, your coping. You have to have something that you're you're moving towards. And if it's going to be okay is part of that, you know, it's going to be okay because I have stuff I want to do in life. And I think the more you have a kind of a, a future that you want, you know, a future that, that you're, 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 you're optimistic about, the more you have that, then you say, well, I got to have to get through this and then I'm going to be okay, you know. So, yeah, definitely, I think. I mean, it, it drives people. And, you know, we don't always have all these ingredients and that makes life more difficult. But then we focus on that problem. You know, how do I get to that, you know? Um, and, I, you know, I think the pieces that we break it down into, you know, what's happening to me, that may be the problem is I don't have a future that I want. And then that's the problem to deal with. That's, that's, a, that's not a healthy situation. Let's find a future that we want, you know? And it's never too late to do that, certainly. But, yeah, that's definitely a, a nice piece of, an important piece of, of life and of getting through things. Let's end it with one daily practice everybody should do in order to be a little more resilient, a little more flexible. Um, well, one of the interesting things that I, I've explored in the book was um, self-talk. And there's a lot of research on self-talk. This is talking to yourself, and, and I suggested some of these things in the book, but they're, you know, I the future's going to be okay. I can do this. You know, what do I need to do here? And those are things we can practice every day. And then there the other pieces, there's more of this in the book, but those are things we can do every day to get us to really get in the habit of doing that. And just, you know, focusing, what's the task I have? And then I'll do it, you know, little pieces, they pile up. I can do this. I like that as a, as a, as a motto. Maybe yeah. I'll get a tattoo. I can, I can do this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, why, it's important to choose those tattoos wisely. So, uh, you wrote a book. Tell me about the book. Uh, the book is called The End of Trauma. Uh, subtitle is What the New Science of Resilience, How the New Science of Resilience is Changing the Way We Think About PTSD. Um, part of the, it, the book has got two different parts. The first part is divided into many parts, but the first part is really looks at the literature on this, this scary word PTSD. And PTSD is not nearly as common as we tend to think it is. So I look at why is that? And that's a lot of my research has shown that. We did research with military veterans, for example, and we show the PTSD rates are maybe 7%. And this is very good data based on hundreds of thousands of soldiers as they leave the military. And 7% is a lot because a lot of people have gone to these recent wars, but it's not what people thought it was, 25%, 40%. and so then the question is, well, how is that? Why is that? And all the other events we've looked at. So I look at what actually happens when we're exposed to what I call a potential trauma. What actually happens? And there, for most people, there's a lot of distress and difficulty because these are hard events to have to go through. You know, blood and, and people are injured and, and they're, you know, things we just wouldn't want to happen at any point. But we get through these events. So why is that? And then I move on in the, in the book to the, the kind of things we've been talking about, flexibility and how that works. You know, there's a lot in between, a lot of research, a lot of stories of people that I've worked with over the years. Um, there's a, the lead story is of a guy who um, I got to know very well who was run over by a sanitation truck in New York City in, the, in like 1.30 in the morning. Sanitation trucks, when they're full, they're very careless. They break laws all the time. They go the one way down, a, they go the wrong way down a one-way street. This particular truck ran a red light and clipped them as they went by and dragged them under all of those wheels. Two, two double axle wheels in the back and crushed his leg and his hip to the point where they were, he had, the, they were removed. He was in a coma for six months, six weeks, I'm sorry. And he's had difficulties ever since. He's had loss of cerebral spinal fluid, and he's had a real rough hoe. And he's gotten through all those things uh, with a plum, really. He's really been quite healthy through the whole thing. He struggled at times, but he's, and he's struggled with what these physical events have caused him, yet he's always found his way through. And so he's in the book, and other people are in the book. And um, it's basically an examination of how we do this. Uh, ending with the COVID pandemic. And it, it really gets into a lot of things we've talked about, Joe, of the, of the flexibility pieces, the mindset for getting through these type of events, 
and the mechanisms we use. So that mindset enables us to. I think maybe that's the piece I haven't said so clearly since we've been talking, that thinking about this, these kind of things, having the right frame, as, as you've, you've talked about so eloquently, really, the right frame of mind, that I'm going to get up that mountain and I'm going to take it one, one section at a time, one step at a time. That mindset then enables you to actually use the tools we have to do it. So that's really what the book is about. It looks at this in great detail. I, I want to. I I'd love to read it. Um, and how do people find it? It's everywhere. I mean, it's on online. It's in bookstores. You know, it's wherever wherever fine books are sold. You know, the. Um, My understanding is you can't buy it if you're not sitting in a cold tub while you're ordering it. Uh, well, you have to. If you buy it while you're sitting in a cold cold tub, you have to have gloves on, I think, or something, not to ruin the page. <laughs> Doctor, I'm going to uh, send you the information on that event. Hopefully we could make Please. that happen. Um, I will look for the frozen guy in shorts and a T-shirt in New York when I'm running or biking <laughs> around uh, Manhattan. And um, I'm so excited that we got to meet. This was awesome. And everybody buy the book, check it out, and hopefully become a little more resilient. Thank you, Joe. It was really a pleasure to meet you. You're awesome. Thanks for listening to this episode of Spartan Up Podcast. At Spartan, we build better humans, and this time we're tackling families. Do you want to raise resilient kids? Of course you do. 10 Rules for Resilience, Mental Toughness for Families is a guidebook, and it's written by Joe DeSena, along with his co-author, Dr. Laura Pence. Learn to be more resilient and to create a more resilient, grittier, stronger, happier, healthier family. Go to spartan.com slash 10 rules. That's the number 10, spartan.com slash 10 rules. To find out more, this episode of Spartan Up is brought to you by Duralane, a single injection that may provide up to six months relief from osteoarthritis knee pain. Risks can include general knee pain and pain at the injection site. You can see full prescribing information at duralane.com. 